All right, my friends, well, I'm excited to introduce you to a new friend that I just met from Fresno, Fresno Pacific. Today, we're talking to uh, Dr. Quentin Kinnison. He is the Associate Professor of Christian Ministry over there at FPU. He's also written, I think, three books. If you Google him, you will find a very impressive bio. He has won some awards. <laughs> He's done a lot of research projects. He's done a lot of articles that people have a lot of nice things to say about. So I'm very humbled and honored to be talking to you today, Quentin. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Yeah. And I pay good money for those, those kind comments. So <laughs> I'm glad it's paying off. Yeah. Thanks. There you go. You have a very uh, impressive online persona. I'm very <laughs> impressed. <laughs> Thanks. All those accolades yeah. aside, we chatted a little bit. Can you tell us more about you, your family? What else sure. do you want to tell us before we kind of dive in here today? Yeah. So um, I'm married. Um, my wife and I have been married for 32 years. Uh, we have a daughter who's uh, uh, 14, going to be 15 soon. Um, adopted from China. She's uh, just an amazing uh, kid. Um, and then uh, the thing I would say is, uh, yeah, my, kind of when I do my bio uh, from the Phoenix area, although I was born in Wyoming, Phoenix is kind of home base for me. So I'm a diehard Phoenix Suns fan. Uh, I, I root for my Diamondbacks, uh, but I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. So that kind of ruins everything for people after that. Um, yeah, uh, grew up in a, in a Baptist home uh, for the most part. My parents were um, Southern Baptists, uh, came to faith through Billy Graham crusade. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, dad sent the call to ministry despite trying to run away from it. So we ended up uh, following him to Grand Canyon uh, College then, now Grand Canyon University, later Southern Seminary, and then back to Phoenix, where I, where I spent most of my formative years. So yeah. Very cool. I know you, you were a pastor for many years. Um, I, I like, you, you, it seems like you've got a kind of unique, but I, I like a, a good blend of um, ministry, but also this um, studious, uh, you do a lot of research, you kind of have both of those worlds, which I think is a really cool um, perspective to have on, especially on a, the topic that we're going to talk about today. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, this idea of praxis is really important to me, this idea, mm -hmm. this, this combination between theory and practice. And yeah. I come from a, 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 tr a school of thought that says that, you know, your, your, the way you think affects how you act, and the way you act affects how you think, and these things sure. are interconnected. Mm -hmm. And and God's spirit working in and through both the mind and also the actions uh, is a way in which God is shaping us and forming us to, to the image of Christ. Yeah. So um, the you know as we talk about here at FPU with the ministry programs, you know it's this important connection between not just what you're learning in the classroom, but what you're practicing in, in the, the the church office mm -hmm. or in the you know in the field or wherever is really really critical. Um, and so you know a lot of what I'm doing. Yeah, a lot of what I'm doing in the classroom is centered around also the experiences that we've had and then how we're continuing to have those experiences. So thank you. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. So the main thing we're going to talk about today, which I, I kind of gather is one of just the biggest passions of your life, which I think is awesome. It's a phrase I've never heard before, but I'm, I'm really excited to dive into it. So this, this phrase of th the theology of disability. So yeah. real quick, can you give us the, the big picture view? What does that term mean and why is it something that you're so interested in? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Matt. Yeah, so th there's a whole field that's actually growing in this in this area. Um, you know, schools like Baylor. Uh, there's a school in Edinburgh that's that's doing really work around this. But it comes down to this idea of what what is what do we think or how do we respond to people's brokenness in their in their lives, um, mm -hmm. and not just the brokenness that they experience and encounter, but also the the brokenness of society as we encounter people who have certain kinds of uh, what we call disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and so, really, in many ways, yeah, it's 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 kind of an older field. Uh, Johnny Erickson Tata, who mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, really kind of began a process of shaping people's thoughts and minds, uh, particularly in the life of the church. Um, so my, the quick version of how I got connected into this idea, um, when I started at Fresno Pacific uh, about 14 years ago, uh, I was introduced to a guy by the name of David Hooker, who was the, the uh, Central Valley Johnny and Friends uh, representative. Okay. And he, he invited me to, to join him in a process of helping shape the life of churches around this thought of how do we reach and care for people affected by disability. Um, Johnny, Johnny has said on a number of occasions that one of the most unreached people groups in the world are people affected by disability. Yeah. Um, so when you, when you begin to think about that, that has some uh, effect for how we think about what is it about our view of the world that we aren't connecting and reaching people but also what does it say about our theology our belief systems that yeah. we don't see that as a, as a viable uh, way of, of approaching people and yeah. so starting that process began to ask the question okay what do we do with this and out of that came uh, an invite from our school of education at fresno pacific uh, the special ed program to begin to offer just a one unit course for special educators to think about their theology disability 
Mm. Uh, and it's a, it's a it's a great class to teach because these are not theologians, these are not ministerial folk. These are these are you know school educators, and so they come into a class where they're going to study theology, and they're freaked out totally. It's it's fantastic. <laughs> so I spend usually the first part of that class just saying to them, "Hey, look, my job here is to help give you language for what you already are experiencing, to help yeah. you begin to recognize and understand what's going on." Because I think that it's true that all of us have a theology around our encounter of people affected by disability. All of mm -hmm. us have a theology, and whether that's a good theology or a bad theology, we all have a theology. Mm -hmm. And my experience has been that people who work directly with you know, folk affected by disability, whether that's students or if they're you know, seniors, um, the largest, the, honestly, the largest group of, of people affected by disability in our churches today are senior adults. Mm. Um, but we tend to think of the kids, right? The ones yeah. that are in special ed programs and things like that. Right. Um, but we all have this kind of theology. and so. How do we begin to put shape to a good theology and begin to understand and see people as God sees them, right? To yeah. recognize their value, their worth, their beauty, their, 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 their goodness that they can bring to the life of a congregation if we mm -hmm. simply just begin to look and view that differently. Yeah. So we, we do a lot of work in unpacking things like, you know, why do we spend so much time in theodicy? You know, we're asking the question, answer, unanswerable questions, right? We spend a lot of time there, but not enough time thinking about what does it mean to include people who are, yeah. who are different from us, who, who seem to be outside of the norm. And mm -hmm. so our theology really begins to, sh to lean into how that, how that shapes. Yeah. I'm so glad you've devoted so much time because it's such an important topic, especially I think today's culture, we just really need to address this in the church. Mm -hmm. um, I want to be careful and you can talk as much about this as you want to. Sure. This is a, a personal issue for you, for you right? Yeah. Like I saw sure a video is. online that you talked about, you had a yep. diagnosis that kind of came out of left field. Can you tell yeah. us that story? Yeah, so um, a guy by the name of Thomas Reynolds talks about this idea of normalcy, that we all live with this idea of, of what is normal in our world. And we, we, we have, we have what, he, what he talks about is we've tended to define normal in really abnormal ways. So it's mm. the supermodel and the superstar, right? Uh -huh. uh, the supermodel is what's normal, and so everybody else is trying to approximate that. And the degree uh -huh. to which you can become normal by approximating the superstar or the super or the, or the supermodel. And by the way, both, we, we know now right, that both those are really probably not real. Uh, right. The steroid scandals, the, the you know the airbrushing us that we kind of come back and say, wait a minute, you know this, this the ideal we said is not right. Yeah. So in my own life, um, you know I, I have passed all my life as somebody who has you know pretty much a, a normal life. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, you know you would look at me and say that person you know, he's, he's okay, uh, with the exception of the glasses, right? You know he, he, he gets along just fine. Sure. Uh, played basketball in, in, in high school. Uh, you know fairly athletic as far as that stuff goes in, during the, those years. Um, you know, still engaged in some of those kinds of activities. Um, but about uh, 13 years ago, right after we came home with our daughter, um, uh, I began to have a series of infections. Uh, I began to encounter a, a number of different um, really odd kind of things that just aren't normal part of, of our, our experiences. I ended up with childhood herpes, which means your gums swell up, right? And it gets really sore. And my doctor looks and goes, you shouldn't have that. You're way too old for this, you know? Oh, um, and, and so I uh, ended up with pneumonia twice. Um, hmm. And after the third kind of major thing that my, my primary care physician, who by the way, is fantastic, um, looked at me and said, you know, I think there's something else going on here. We need to, we need to test some things. And so they began testing my, my antibody response, uh, my ability, my body's ability to create antibodies. Mm -hmm. um, she did an initial test and discovered that in fact, my antibodies were not as high as they should be. They sent me to a, an immunologist who was, a, again, wonderful Christian man. Um, and really, really fascinating. Uh, everyone said, I have to remind him, we're here to do my doctor's work, not the theology work, right? So, um, but he, he, he was uh, able to test me a second time. And by the time, between the, it's like the three months between my primary care physician and my, my, my immunologist, my antibodies completely dropped off. So uh -huh. antibodies are those things, I mean, I think we all know this now with COVID, right? But our antibodies are those things that our body uses to respond to bacteria or to viruses or other things. And it creates a, an active response that occurs so that when you encounter a virus or a bacteria, your body goes and attacks it, kills it, and then sends a message for the rest of the body to come and attack it. Yeah. My body doesn't do that. So as, as far as a line of defense goes, I'm missing a significant element. So yeah. while everybody's getting their vaccines, and I know it's controversial, I encourage people to get their vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, while people, everybody's getting their vaccines, when I get the vaccine, it doesn't actually produce the effect that it was supposed to. Okay. And so as a result of that, I become more susceptible to all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, and so, so now all of a sudden here I have this appearance of normalcy, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I can approximate, maybe not to the supermodel or superstar athlete, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. but I can approximate that, but I look like things are, are okay. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, and yet the reality is I'm, I'm actually much more vulnerable than it looks. So that began to, to raise for me some questions around this question of, of disability and theology of disability, right? Mm-hmm. Um, why is it I get a pass in our social constructs, right? Why is yeah. it I get, I get included in, but a person with cerebral palsy or a person who has autism or something else is, is more excluded? Yeah. It begins to raise questions about how we show partiality to people based upon our cultural understandings of normalcy. Right. Rather than right, the reality that they're a person valued by God and loved by God because they're a human being shaping yeah. the image of God. Right. And so that personal experience really opened for me a new way of recognizing this this reality and yeah. experience. That, thank you for sharing that. And that's it's yeah. it's cool that you have that personal element to it. So one thing I've, I was thinking about, when I was kind of getting ready for this is it seems mm-hmm. like um, I think we all know the importance of special needs, both like in the church and in the schools. Like, I think everyone would say that's a good thing. We're, su- we're supportive of it, but I think we have a tendency, our, our level of care and empathy seems to ratchet up when we either it affects us personally or we know someone. Right. And so yeah. I, don't, I don't know when that diagnosis came in your like um, range of things in your career, but I guess do we need to feel bad, feel bad about that? Is that just natural? Like, it seems like we, we should care about this, but usually it takes some kind of a, an event or a personal event personal sure. for us to really kind of ratchet up how we interact. Is, yeah. Do you feel like that's true? And is that necessarily a bad thing? What yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, just, should we feel bad about it? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm of the mind that conviction is one thing, guilt is another. Guilt immobilizes, yeah. conviction compels us to action and activity. Um, yeah. So we ought, to be, we ought to feel convicted when we become yeah. aware of something that's not right in our world. Sure. Uh, if we feel guilty, I think that too often that causes us to shut down. So I, that if that makes any sense. Um, yeah. <laughs> excuse me. I, I I think what I would say is um, one one thing I would hope is from from things like this, the podcast, and from uh-huh. the work that I'm doing in other places, um, yeah. that people become more aware of the fact that this is a real thing. Sure. Um, and I would say that for two reasons. One, um, there is a tremendous need to reach an unreached people group. Right. Uh, there are people that, that, that God loves desperately, that God cares for deeply, uh, that feel unloved because of the way society and cultures have uh, have identified this normalcy and they don't fit in that that frame. Yep. Um, and that's that's a framework that the world has imposed. Um, you know, uh, this, there's an idea called the homogeneous unit principle that people like people like themselves. Uh-huh. Um, and it's true. We see that in scripture. We see that in, in other places. But it's not necessarily because that's a good thing. It's because mm-hmm. that's our brokenness works in this world. Right. Yeah, right. And so God is doing this amazing thing through Pentecost, Pentecost Sunday just passed, right? So mm-hmm. God's doing this amazing thing through Pentecost to help us begin to recognize the way in which God is drawing us into one family with all the beauty of difference and, 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 and distinction that yeah. we can become a, a real people. Well, that includes this thing with disability, right? People affected right. by disability have, have differences. And, and just real quick, I, I think of disability in two different ways. There's, mm-hmm. you know, kind of the language in the disability circles are, and there's, there's, diff- there's, diff- there's disability and there's differently abled. Right. Okay. okay. Um, so we talk about people like me who have a physical ailment that, that it affects my ability to do certain things physically. Uh, mm-hmm. Sometimes people with cerebral palsy that kind of fits in there. Yeah. That's different from people who are the, the language of neurodivergence, right? So yeah. the autism spectrum, things like that. They have abilities. They're mm-hmm. just very different than the kinds of abilities most of us think about. So yeah. if you give a task to somebody who has, you know, has a high functioning uh, autism spectrum, mm-hmm. they have a tremendous ability to focus, to do this yeah. work, to really do it with excellence, to, to yeah. pay attention to the details. We just don't value that in the same way. Maybe we value some of these other social things right. that, they, that they don't produce. Yep. So they're differently able versus somebody who's disabled. So mm-hmm. as we think about all of that, I think what I would say is, I don't know that we need to feel bad, but we need to, we need to become aware. Mm-hmm. And then we need to begin asking different set of questions. Right. Yep. What does it mean to create an environment where people who are either disabled or differently abled are able to live into their sense of purpose and calling, uh, into their identity as human beings, in yeah. living in community with other human beings? Yeah. Because the, the real injury of disability is not always the physical. I mean, we often look at suffering as being about the, 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 the physical suffering. Yeah. And there, for some people, there is real physical suffering. I don't typically experience that because mine's, again, pretty pretty, it only happens when I get sick, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but some people do have physical suffering. But the real suffering comes from the uh, fact that we're created to be in community with people, and mm-hmm. people affected by disability are excluded from community. Right, right. So I think what we have to begin to ask is, okay, how do we create an environment where people who are affected by disability, or are differently abled, mm-hmm. can recognize that they are valued and loved in the community, 
and not be not in spite of mm -hmm. right but because they are people of value and worth before god yeah i think that's the piece where i say you know rather than feeling you know guilty or you know bad mm -hmm. how do we begin to see differently how do we begin yeah. to see people the way god sees them and begin to love them accordingly yeah, yeah that's great can, can I, I add one more can i have more sure. thing on that go for it yep and it's not just for the people affected by disability by the way mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, this is also about the community. Absolutely. There's a great story in Second Kings. I say great story is the wrong way of saying that. There's a famine. People are eating their kids. It's not a great story. <laughs> but there's, there's this amazing story in Second Kings, uh, chapter seven. So it's, it's, it's the siege of a siege of Samaria. Um, it's, you know, it's happening. There's terrible things are going on. They're eating their kids. Like I said, they can't find any food. And the king's had it. He's going to have, you know, Elisha killed. Um, and um, Elijah makes a prediction, right? That, that, no, that it's, it's going to be okay. God's going to provide. There are four lepers mm -hmm. that are actually outside the wall. Mm -hmm. right? So, so in, in, in Reynolds' work, he talks about this idea of body capital. The body capital is the things we can produce that gives value to our society, right? Mm -hmm. He says, if you don't have body capital, that's when you're excluded. But if you do have body capital, you're included. Okay. Well, what classic example of that is there than, than a siege, right? Everything mm -hmm. of value is inside the city. Everything that's not of value is outside the city. Right. These four lepers are outside the city. They're going to die. They either go in the city and die with everybody by starvation, or they go to the, the Syrians and, you know, and figure it out. <laughs> so they go, and they end up being the ones who discover that God has scattered the enemy. Mm. There's this really great phrase in there that talks about uh, their, their response to that. They said, today is a day of, and the word is good news. Now, in the Septuagint, that word is actually the euangelion, the word good news we translate in the New Testament as the good news. Yeah, okay. There's this, this today is a day of good news, and God will punish us ever so severely if we don't go and deliver this message hmm. to our people. Yeah, wow. The, the lepers, the ones who are excluded, hmm. become the instruments of God's good news, right? Yeah. And how many times do we as a faith community miss out yeah. on God's good news in our presence because we've excluded people who are the gospel bearers, for lack of a better way of saying it, in our yep. midst. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not just about what the benefit for people affected by disability. It's also about the community of faith. Right. Yeah. That's that's a great example. I love that. Yeah. Okay. I, wanna, I can already tell we're going to, yeah. our time's going to yeah. go very fast. We've got a lot I want to hit too. So I want to make sure we leave some time to talk about specifically people in ministry, people in churches, what we yeah. can do differently, sure. more effectively. But first, I'm really glad you mentioned the differently abled versus disabled. That's one of my questions for you is I think a lot of times people who aren't either they're not educated or they're not directly in this in this world. I think sometimes un unintentionally like our language is either hurtful or we might kind of separate people in ways that we don't mean to. Yeah. Even the word normal, I would imagine we right. should maybe rethink usage of that word. But yep. something that I, I think you talk about in one of your books or articles or somewhere was the idea of people first language, yeah. which I think would be just a good thing to educate people on. I've noticed that you've been doing that even, even in our discussion sure. so far. So can you explain what that is and what else might we be doing that's either hurtful or ineffective that we maybe we're just blind to if we're not in this world very often? Yeah, so um, there, there are a couple of different things I would say. First of all, yeah, the people first language is the first uh, most important thing. Um, one, of the, one of the problems we have is we tend to, you know, for instance, uh, that person, um, how do I want, I'm trying to think of a good one. Um, the blind guy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, he's blind. Yeah. Well, he is blind, but he, he isn't his blindness. Right, he's a person he's, first. He's a person first, right? Yeah, right. Uh, a person who is uh, crippled. Yeah. You know, the crib. Or even like yeah. an autistic right. child, right? We, that's, right. Uh, yeah. we hear that kind of thing. Autistic all the time. kid, right? Yeah, right. He's, he's, he's a child with autism. Right. 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 And so this idea of using people first thing. So I, I try to model that way, you know, pe people affected by disability. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. People are, I, first of all, I think more of us are affected by disability than we realize. Mm -hmm. That's a mm -hmm. different conversation. Yep. Um, but using that people first language begins this this way of reorienting our own sense of thinking so we see the see folk as people first not as their disability first right yep, right the right. person in a wheelchair mm -hmm, not mm -hmm. the wheelchair bound person right right yep, it, it's like there's that. a different way of, of engaging that um and so starting with the language and how we think about those things i think is really mm -hmm. important um i think the other thing too is you know the education of self is, is part of that process but you know um assuming people need help because they're affected by disability rather than asking them if they want help right yeah. it's another uh -huh. that's another way we do it we make assumptions based on our ability that they should have this ability if they don't then there's something wrong with them and we need to make up for that deficiency yeah they right. may not need our help they may not want our help 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So rather than assuming that on them, how do we ask them, right? Uh, yeah. This is particularly important for people affected by, by wheelchairs that are wheelchair bound. Um, you know, people in wheelchairs, the wheelchair is an extension of their body. Right. So don't automatically assume they want you to push, right? Mm-hmm. I wouldn't mm-hmm. go up behind, behind you, Matt, and start pushing you down the, <laughs> the aisle because you need help. Right. Unless you ask me to, right? Yeah. So why would we do that with a wheelchair? So yeah. things like that, they become a, a way of, of recognizing the humanity and the personhood of a person yeah. uh, rather than the way that their disability manifests as being their, their dominant trait. Well, uh, yeah. And while we're on there, so how much, again, just for people who are maybe, because I think usually like if someone's pushing yeah. the wheelchair, they're trying to be helpful, right? Right. Absolutely. The heart yeah. is right. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And I think another thing that we do that again, might go the wrong way, kind of like what you were just saying, if we see someone in our church that maybe has a disability, we might kind of go out of our way to try to help them, like you were just saying, but yeah. sometimes that might actually just draw more attention or whatever. So if, if someone listening, we have a lot of people, again, leaders in churches, sure. maybe if, again, if they don't have many steps in this ironed out yet, how much do we pay attention to that and how much do we ignore it? And how do we do that really carefully? Yeah. So, so I think, I think, again, the, the danger is we can be so worried about stepping on somebody's toes that we actually end up ignoring them right yeah right and and that that gets to that exclusion factor that we talked about mm-hmm. if 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 i wanted to know if you needed something i'll get to know you first yeah right yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I sit down i have conversations with you, i get to know who you are i ask if you need anything right yeah. i wouldn't assume what you need i'd ask you need anything so i'd have those conversations and of course there are levels to which people are comfortable engaging right so yeah. we talk about somebody who has uh, is on the autism spectrum you might want to think about okay how do i approach this person mm-hmm. right what what would be helpful to them um you know how do i engage them? but it, it starts with getting to know the person first yeah. right mm-hmm. so rather than stepping in as a um, I'll, I'll use the language, stepping in as a savior uh-huh. to rescue them and save the day. Right. How do you come alongside them as a friend mm-hmm. and begin to know them and, and care for them in a way that a friend would? Yeah. And likewise, are there places where you can invite them to help you and to care yeah. for you? Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. Because it's a mutual relationship. It's not, it's not one that's built on kind of this, it's predicated on this idea that I'm, I'm better than you, so I'm going to help you. Yeah. It's built on this idea that, hey, we're, we're in this together. Mm-hmm. I need you, you need me. What can I do for you? Hey, can you, can you help me think about this? Yeah, that's good. I like that a lot. So there's kind of relationship, right? It's always back to relationship. Yeah, absolutely. I like that. I like that approach. So I'm, I'm, I work on staff at a church. I'm sure a lot of people listening do. So Mm -hmm. one of, one of my first thoughts as we're talking is there's kind of the, um, helping or reaching out or getting to know the people in your, already in your church that have some kind of disability. But I think there's also this, this, um, desire to have our, facilities or services or ministries kind of ready to go if a person with a disability yeah, sure. comes, right? So like if it's a Sunday morning or if it's a kid's program or I'm glad yeah. you, I'm, I'm checking myself because I first think of kids, right? Sure. Mean, it's our natural tendency. Also right. elderly, right? right? So what are, just from your experience, your research, what are some things that churches typically aren't doing that we should maybe, especially just so we can be ready if, if someone comes to one of our churches, we're ready and not behind. Yeah, yeah. So I think one of the first things I'd say is uh, pay attention to barriers that are created, uh, physical barriers, right? Mm-hmm. So if you have if you have a children's um, programming that's on the second floor that's only accessible by stairs, mm-hmm. you've mm-hmm. automatically excluded children in wheelchairs unless you're going to take them up the stairs. And yeah. we've had that. I've, I've been a part of churches where that's happened, where people use the you know carry them up the wheelchair up the stairs. Yeah. And it's mm-hmm. so humiliating for the, for the kid, for the parents, yeah. right, to have this. And, and, and it's, it's hard Sunday after Sunday. So think about physical barriers that are created. Yeah. So that's the first thing. Uh, do, you, do you have, um, you know, is, is there, if you call people to an altar call, right, what does that mean for somebody who, who takes yeah. a little longer to move and to get there? Um, sure. can, can they hear? Can they see? Is it super loud, mm-hmm. right? So for people who are on the spectrum, super loud noises can be really troubling difficult yeah. is there a space that they can be where that's that can be accommodated is there other ways in which you know headphones or things can be used yeah. um if people have a, if people have a tendency to to cry out because of you know a, a particular condition they might have mm-hmm. um, is that still okay in your yeah. service right. how, do, how do the leaders of the church communicate we're just glad they're here we're not worried about that yeah don't let that distract you let that be a reminder that god's beautiful people are present with us right? yeah 
Mm-hmm. Um, so things like that. So how do physical barriers, how do, how do kind of social barriers uh, instigate there? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, again, most places that are near someplace that has a, a Johnny and Friends organization or one of their I mean, denominations have their own, own regional groups, um, you know, ask them to come in and do an assessment for you. You know, mm-hmm. what barriers mm-hmm. might be in the way? Yeah. Second thing is have a plan. Mm-hmm. Um, too often, um, you know, we get surprised um, and, you know, the kid shows up and they've got autism and you know, we, we tell them, oh, no, don't leave sleep. We'll be fine. But we don't have a, a way of, of planning for that. Right. Do you need to, does he need to have a buddy? Does she need to have somebody, right, that's with her the whole time? Um, yeah. if, if loud noises are hard for that person, for that, mm-hmm. for that child or for that, that person, is, is there a place they can go to be, to be away from that loud noises? Mm-hmm. Um, are we expecting somebody to sit that, that is constantly in motion? Right? Yeah. Um, are we are we asking people to? Um, I mean, this thinking about our language, right? Asking them to stand, right? Yeah, everybody stand, right. right? Well, right. not everybody can stand. So this is where the language: if you're able, please rise, you know, or yeah. uh, as you worship as where you are. Um, so things like that become become part of it. So again, a lot of it comes back to awareness and recognizing. And then I think you know, again, if you if you're blessed to have people in your church who are already affected, begin to ask mm-hmm. them some questions. Yeah. Where are we creating barriers? Where, mm-hmm. where is it harder for us? Uh, yeah. How do we do that? But do so with the recognition that there may be some hard things you hear mm-hmm. that you didn't intend. Right. But they have to be, they have to be, they have to be thought through. So I don't yeah. know if that answers the question or no, not. It's a kind of starting point. Yeah. It definitely does. And one of the ministries hard, right? Ministry, yeah, right. Every church ministry is hard. Every staff oh, is different. Absolutely. Every city is different. So one thing, again, just because I work at a church, what's going through my mind is I, I work at a pretty big church. Right. And we yeah. have we have people who think our music is too loud. We have people who think music is too quiet. <laughs> think, you think it's too light or it's too dark? Or sure, sure. We, we're, we're blessed with enough space where we probably could find a room. If someone right. needed to go on their own, we probably could find a room where they could do that. Mm-hmm. A lot of churches may not have that sure. luxury. And even... I'm thinking about number of volunteers. Like I know our church struggles to have enough volunteers for a, a kids ministry at sure. all, let, let alone if we're going to try to start having buddies. And so again, we don't, our goal is not to make anyone, like you said, we're not trying to make any church feel guilty for not, no, doing no, things. no. but just as I'm thinking to myself, this, it, it, it can be kind of daunting. So do you, what's, what's a good first step? Like, should we at least just have a person who's kind of keeping an eye on these things or is there a checklist we can follow? What, what's kind of a good first step if this sounds intimidating? Yeah, I think, I think there, it needs a champion. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there needs to be a champion. Somebody will step up and say, Hey, I want to, I want to be the person who kind of helps us to think about these things. I'm concerned about this. It's something I care about. It's something I believe that God's played as a call in my life to pursue as yeah. far as for our church's ministry. Uh, and I want to be that champion. Sometimes yeah. it's a pastor. Sometimes it's a, a church leader. Sometimes it's a lay person who just, you know, they care. Um, yeah. You know, it might be a, a teacher. Um, oftentimes special ed teachers come to their churches and they're like, I see what we need to be doing and we're not doing. I can help yeah. us with that. Um, yeah. And then what I would say is to the, to the pastor and church leaders, um, empower them and support them. Mm-hmm. Um, Lauren Annan, who was the last director that I worked with here at uh, John and Friends for a while, um, she, she's a, a pastor's wife. She was also a special ed, uh, actually did way more than that, but uh, worker. But she, she went to her church and she, and she started their ministry at a church here locally. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it started with her and her passion, but she had the support of her pastors to really step in and do that work. And so the pastors would make announcements like, hey, we're going to have guests that are going to be here. And mm-hmm. it may not always be like you're used to. But yeah. we want to welcome them and love them because that's what God's called us to do. Yeah. So I think it needs a champion. I think it needs, a, and I think the other thing I would say is it needs. It just needs to be based in love. You can't. You, no church can do everything. Even right. even the big churches can't do everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, a small church it can't do everything. So how do you, how do you create an environment where people feel loved, yeah. and, and welcomed, and and they don't have you know. Maybe it doesn't, maybe they, they go to the foyer when the music's on, right? Mm-hmm, or, mm-hmm. or maybe you create an environment where they, they can feel comfortable to get up and to walk in the back of, yeah. the, of the worship center and mm-hmm. everybody understands that that's what's going on. Um, it's, 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 it's less about the big programmatic things and more about the small ways we begin to recognize that might lead to programmatic things, right? Right. But, but think about how we care for people as people. And then likewise, again, how do we let them care for us, right? Yeah. Is there a way that, that we could, I mean, think about it. If, if, if loud sounds are hard for people, what about creating space of, for silence or quiet in a worship service? Yeah. Well, you know what? We live in a busy world. Yeah. Silence is a really important space for us to encounter and engage God. Yeah. 
yeah. might be that God's telling us to, okay, I, I love your worship. I love the, the loud, but I also want you to have the quiet so you can be, you know, still before me. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, that's a, that's a part of the, 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 the process as well. Yeah. That's really good. Okay. Well, yeah, I know you've the, got a, you got a class you need to teach here in just a few minutes. <laughs> but one more, thing, just as we begin to wrap up, yeah, again, please. I, I love and respect your, again, the combination of academics and your kind of pastoral yeah. experience. So just to wrap things up again, I love the phrase of theology of disability. Yeah. So again, with your kind of pastor heart, um, this is important, right? Like I think right. we, we have all this, there's all the stories about Jesus caring for the little children. Right. But right. again, right. everybody. So is there anything else kind of on the theology side or just the, re the reminder of the importance of the individual? What else haven't we talked about yet that you want to kind of include? Yeah, I think, I think we need to be pay attention to the way we read scripture and where mm -hmm. we come to the, to the biblical text and understand some things that about it. Um, if we don't understand culture and context in which scripture is being written and what's happening there, we can miss some of the really important cues. So we oftentimes look at the miracles and see them only as being about physical healing. And they are about physical healing. I don't want to, I don't want to, to deny that. Um, but really in many ways, they're, they're about much bigger issues than the physical healing. Mm -hmm. um, and they have to do with things like you're talking about a culture where there's no real social safety net. You're yeah. talking about a culture where um, disease or um, illness or disability ha means ex significant societal exclusion. Mm -hmm. um, so when Jesus heals the leper, right, and he says to him, what, go and tell, show yourself before the priest so that you can, what, be, clean, be, be deemed clean and mm -hmm. allowed to reintegrate into society. So you can come back to your family, to your, to your work, your job, to your to your community, to your worship, to all that stuff. So I think we need, to, we need to begin to recognize the ways in which in that cultural context, the physical healing was more about the social healing and yeah. the, the integration back into community than it was about the physical. Hmm. And I think we also need to recognize the ways in which, you know, what does it mean to worship a, and I'm gonna say this, it, it's, it's a phrase sometimes people will get uncomfortable with, but a disabled uh, savior. Hmm. Jesus he still has his scars. <laughs> Yeah, right? that's interesting. Yeah, he, he, he does. He, they, they don't go away after the crucifixion. So he is a scarred savior. Right, right. Um, so what does that mean to recognize, right, that in scripture, uh, there's some strong speculation that Paul probably had epileptic seizures or had had mm -hmm. serious some kind of serious ailment. He couldn't see. So he had to write with large letters. Right. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean that God's using somebody like Paul? Uh, yeah. who might have this kind of, of serious part of life. So we need to begin to read scriptures with, with, with eyes that say it's not just about healing. It's not just about, you know, restoring people's physical bodies. Mm -hmm. That stuff will all take care of itself. But if we begin to look at the things like how do we recognize their basic humanity? How do we recognize their need for social integration? How do we recognize the need for um, meaningful participation in community? Uh, mm -hmm. means that they give back to us. How do we recognize? If we begin to see that part of it, um, I think that's really important. And the last thing I say, and this is kind of my last kind of theological perspective. You know, Second uh, Corinthians talks about this idea. We, we hold this thing, we hold this treasure in broken jars. We're all disabled on some level. Yes, right. Right. We all are. Yep. Some of us just can hide it better than others. <laughs> right. Right. So if we if we begin to approach the conversation with humility of, you know, I'm broken in some ways that you can't see, and just because you're broken in ways that I can see we're more alike than we are different. Right. And yet somehow God's treasure is able to reside in this beautiful broken jar, just like the beautiful broken jar that you are. Yeah. And that's what it means to be God's people, to hold yeah. this treasure together in our brokenness. Oh, I love that. That's yeah. That's a great reminder that we all have those disabilities that, you know, may or may not be quite as noticeable. Okay. So I know I said that was the last question. Last thing I want to wrap up with. Yeah. So again, you've got welcoming children with special needs, your book. I said it's on Amazon. I'm sure people can find it. You yeah, let me just to... let me say a quick word about that. So sure. uh, yeah. the the book is is built is made for uh, Christian schools, so K okay. through twelve schools. Mm -hmm. But there are there are pieces in there that will be very helpful to churches. Um, so yeah, I just want to make sure people understand what they're getting when they buy the book. <laughs> sure, so, sure. So def check that out for sure. You have mentioned Johnny Erickson Tata a few times. Is that again? I'm sure that maybe be a good first resource for people to look into. Yeah, Johnny, Johnny, Johnny and friends. Their work is really uh, profound. They're doing good work, and they they have resources specifically to help churches come and begin to think about how to start ministries at the very base level, right? How does what does it mean just to offer a respite? What does it mean to just you know, have somebody to take care? What does it mean just to be aware of what's happening? So they they are a great resource for churches. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. 
Well, Quentin, it's been a pleasure getting to know you. Thank you for educating us on this topic. I love the work you're doing. So thank you for what you're doing at FPU and all your other outlets. It's such an important topic. So thank you for sharing so openly with us today. It's been great getting to know you. Thanks, man. Thank you for the opportunity. It's a privilege. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much.